Good morning. Hope you are ready this morning for our VBS kickoff. Uh, it is concrete and cranes. So we figured that since you enjoy construction so much around the city, uh, it makes you happy, puts you in a good mood, that we thought we'd bring it into the church and just bring those same attitudes and joy that construction brings in our lives uh, here. No, th this, is, this is it. This is what we're doing for, uh, for our VBS this year. I do want to make sure that all of our kinder through fifth grade kids, everybody has a Lego block. Does everybody have one? If you don't have one, then raise your hand and we'll get you one. But everybody should have, kinder through fifth should have a Lego block. If you don't, oh, there's one right there I see. So raise your hand if you don't. And, uh, and we'll get you one, and we'll be ready to rock and roll with that. Um, and we'll get to that here in just a second. But we are, we are looking at concrete and cranes, and it's important to, to look the part. Uh, got my, my hard hat here, but, but this is my outside one. So I don't, I don't want it to, to get, you know, I, I'm inside, so I need the more formal one. That's what I needed right there. So this is my... My hard hat, and I'll say some hard things, and you might throw stuff at me, so I want to be prepared for what might happen, or that wrecking ball might get me uh, right there. You know, these, aren't these um, decorations incredible, though? Like, that's pretty amazing stuff right there. Brandon Doric and uh, Chris Chalman and their crew put all that together, and it just looks so fantastic, and you'll see it all around the campus this week. Like, you will literally be invited into a construction zone, and, and yet you'll find joy in it, and so I'm super excited to be able to do that. However, this idea of concrete and cranes is an interesting topic for VBS that we're supposed to un unpack and understand and all of this stuff. And so I thought, okay, the best thing I can do is, is do a Bible word search for concrete. And so I did, and I found that the word concrete is mentioned zero times in the Bible. And uh, so then I decided, well, let's, let's look at cranes. Cranes, you know, like if we're going to do this for VBS, concrete and cranes, I looked up cranes, zero mentions in the Bible. And I thought, oh, this is great. Uh, Miss Sam picked a topic that's not in the Bible for VBS. So we're going to have a VBS that's not based on Scripture this week. And I hope that you... Are, I'm just kidding. I, I, I dig a little deeper. That's what I need to do. If concrete and cranes are not in Scripture, then there's got to be something like construction needs to be in the Bible. So we look up construction. I found four instances in the Bible of construction. Uh, Solomon mentioned it a couple of times. King Ahaz. And then a guy named Shishbezar, which... I've never heard of him either, but uh, apparently he was involved in construction, and, uh, and I don't even know if he's going to heaven, but uh, he was involved in the Bible, but I don't think that's what Miss Sam wants me to talk about today is Shish Bazaar. Um, that would be a very quick sermon. Um, so then I thought, what's next? We have cranes, concrete, construction. Well, the end goal of all of that is to build something. We need to, to build something. So I look up the word build. There it is, 236 times in the Bible. Okay, so maybe she's on to something after all with this construction and concrete and cranes that we're going to be talking about this week. So that's what I, I wanted to have. That's why it's important that you guys have your, your brick, because that's going to come later. So listen, and I'm going to call you up here to help me with something. But, but hang on to them right now for just a second, because you're going to get some help, and we're going to build this, this morning and on some things uh, for that. But I also have some other friends. So Ella, where are you at? Ella and Jeremiah, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. You may see over here we have giant Jenga. Now, you may see Jenga in your living room that sits on the coffee table. And thing. We created a giant Jenga, and so what I've asked for them to do is just to play Jenga while I preach, and uh, that way if this gets boring, there's something else to look at, uh, and so you can, you can do that, uh, and, and, have, and that's what teenagers do anyway. They're constantly on their phone and the TV, and what I, it's amazing how they multitask, so we're going to see kind of how life is for them, but we'll check in on them later, and we'll have a good time with that. But if you have your Bibles, what I want you to do is turn to Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14 is where we're going to start today. We're going to hit several places as we go. Uh, construction is not something that's just a, a one-step solution. Uh, there's a whole process that goes through it, and concrete and cranes and all of this are important in the process of what we do so we can look at God's Word for the help that we have. So Luke chapter 14, uh, verse 28 is where we're going to start. I'll be reading from the NIV to start with today. It says this, Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. That's what they're doing. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. I don't think anybody starts off with a goal, 
I'm going to do what I can today to be made fun of. Like, I don't think people set out on their day to go, all right, by the end of the day, I want everybody who sees me to laugh at me. I want everybody to ridicule me. I want everybody to make fun of me. So God gives this warning here, like, if you do this, that's going to happen. And so to help understand even a little bit better of this, I want to read it from the message version of Scripture, uh, the same passage in Luke 14. It says this, Is there anyone here who, planning to build a new house, doesn't first sit down and figure out the cost so you'll know if you can complete it? If you only get the foundation laid and then run out of money, you're going to look pretty foolish. Everyone passing by will poke fun at you. He started something he couldn't finish. Now, if you've been here the last few weeks, you know that Pastor Mark is in a series right now about finishing strong. And, and so many people in Scripture did not finish strong, and there's reasons why that happened. Well, here's one of those things of someone that doesn't finish strong. And, and so the first thing, the first point that we're going to have today in this idea of concrete and cranes is this. We've got to count the cost. If we're going to do something, we've got to figure out the cost of doing it. And, and we have lots of references for that in our world today. We're going to look at the cost of building a building. We're going to look at the cost of building a house. We're going to look at the cost of buying a car. We're going to look at the cost of going to school. Uh, we're going to look at the cost of what weddings cost anymore. Holy cow, those are expensive. And there's all of these things that are expensive. Now, these verse that we just read talked about building a house, right? And houses are expensive in that. So I need some help with this. So I don't, Lila and Cynthia, I don't know where y'all sat, but come up here, please. I need Lila, Sambito, Cynthia, Slayton, come on up here. So these are two of the smartest people that you'll ever meet, or at least we'll find out in a second if they are. So come on, right up here, right up here so everybody can see. Now, how old are you? You're both 10 years old, so a lot of life that you've lived, a lot of experience. One question, whoever gets closest wins the prize, okay? You want to know what the prize is or you want the question first? That's a big question. I'll tell you the prize, Chick-fil-A gift card right here, but you can't spend it today. <laughs> okay, one question for you to answer. Each of you get a shot, okay? So the question is this, how much does a house cost? lot. That's no. <laughs> I need a number. Give me a number. What does a house cost? 500,000. 500,000 is her guess. Okay. What's your guess? 50,000. 50,000. So 50,000, 500,000. Let me look at my notes so we can get the exact price here. The exact price of a house in the United States in 2022, $428,700. Fantastic. You win the prize. You're a little closer than that, but you're not going to go away empty-handed because I'm a nice guy and I'm a cool youth pastor. So everybody gets Chick-fil-A. Round of applause for my ladies. Y'all can go have a seat. Now, I believe Cynthia is a little bit of an advantage because what does her father do for a living? He is in real estate, but, um, but he didn't know the question ahead of time. So I, I guess that's good discipleship. And, uh, and he's, he's healthier. It's interesting about that, though, this idea of counting the cost. And when you look at buildings or houses or whatever, it's fascinating what our perspective is on that. 50000 500000 The truth is, both of those amounts could buy a house. It just depends on what kind of house you want. It depends on what your standard is, right? Let's roll the clock back. 1990. In the United States, the average cost of a house was $75,200. 1990. You're like, holy cow, that's incredible. In the Austin area in 1990, it was 74000 Austin was below market for the United States. You think that's changed? In 2000, take 10 years later, 2000, it, the average price of a house in the United States, $82,500. The average house price in the Austin area, $119,600 in 1990. Again, fast forward to 2022. Average price in the United States, $428,700. The average price in the Austin area, $640,000. Like that's, that's the culture that we've lived in. And, and my guess is no one just buys a house without knowing how much it costs. No one goes, I'll take that one. How much? It doesn't matter. I'm just going to buy it. Like no one does that because you, you consider the cost. You count the cost of what it's going to cost me to be able to live in this house or drive this car, or go to this school, or whatever it is that's there. So what is the cost that God wants us to count? Is he wanting us to build a house this week? 
Like, is that his goal? Like, all right, VBS, we're going to build a house. I mean, our budget's not going to afford that at our church, um, and we're not going to be able to do that right there. I don't think so. So earlier in the book of Luke, go back to chapter 9. We're going to jump back there for just a second because he tells us we got to count the cost so we don't get made fun of, so we don't get ridiculed, so we don't run out of money or whatever the things are that's going on. So Luke chapter 9, starting in verse 23, then he said to them all, and this is Jesus speaking again, then Jesus said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self? Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and of the angels. Wow. Count the cost, not of building a house, of building a life. If we're going to count the cost of what it costs for a life, it starts by being a disciple of Jesus which is way more than just going to church. It's way more than checking a box. It's way more than showing up on that. To, to be a disciple is, is more than going to VBS or going to camp. It, it's bigger and wider than that. It's not going to church on Sunday and getting your daily dose of Jesus and then you leave and don't do anything different the rest of the week. That, that's not it at all. What's, what's amazing to me is this, is we love the idea of Jesus picking up a cross for us we're less enthused about picking up a cross for him. And that's what hurts our foundation. That's what hurts our life. And we wonder why these things are struggling, why these things are falling apart, why these things aren't falling into place the way we want them to. Well, have we counted the cost? Have we understood that what Jesus did for us is not just a suggestion, it's an example? And he says, if you want to be my disciple, deny yourself, take up your cross daily and follow me. Not take up your cross weekly. Not take up your cross on Sundays and Wednesdays. Not take up your cross whenever you're in desperate need. But take up your cross every day. But it doesn't feel good, Alan. It hurts. I'm tired. I think Jesus was too. He's not asking us to do anything that he wasn't willing to do himself. Matter of fact, he never said, take up your cross every day and get physically nailed to it. And he said, those that are weary and heavy laden, come to me and I will give you rest. I will give you my burden. We can walk this out together. You're not meant to do it alone. Are we counting the cost, time, energy? I don't see anything in there that's financial in in nature when it comes to being a disciple of Christ. You don't have to write a check. You don't have to give half of your savings. You have to give all of your life. And are we willing to count the cost? Dallas Willard said this, a great quote. He said, being a disciple is the process of becoming who Jesus would be if he were you. Wow, that kind of hurts when you think about it. Being a disciple is the process of becoming who Jesus would be if he were you. Would he watch what I watch? Would he go where I go? Would he say what what I say? Would he give what I give? Would he build what I build? God bless you. Going all good over there, guys? You're building? Yeah, okay. Speaking of building, let's jump Matthew chapter 7. Let's jump over there real quick. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. Because I think once we count the cost, there's a second step that has to be taken. Let's look look at this, Matthew 7, 24. It says, Therefore... Anyone who hears these words of mine, again, Jesus is speaking here again. This isn't secondhand information. This is coming straight from God. If anyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. There's one choice of foundation. It's the rock. It's something that seems solid, something that seems supportive, something that seems strong. But there's a second option, verse 26. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew. (laughs) 
I think we know the answer to this. And it fell with a great crash. I, I think we just disagree. Thank you, guys. Y'all can sit down because apparently you don't know how to count the cost. Um, or really have much of a foundation is kind of what I'm, I'm thinking there. But, but we, we, we see maybe what that looked like or sounded like when Jesus told this story. It's not a matter of if the storms are coming, it's when. But it is a matter of what foundation you choose to build on. I, I drive around my neighborhood and I see several places in my neighborhood where houses are not built. There's a big lot. It's plenty big enough to do that. But they don't build houses on these certain lots. Why? Because the foundation isn't strong enough. It looked okay. But if you go under the surface, you can see there's caves and there's holes and there's instability that cannot support a house. And I think in our world today, we spend a lot of time building on things that look good, but we don't dig deep enough to know how strong the foundation is. And what's crazy to me is God says this, I want you to build the foundation on the rock. The wise man builds the foundation on the rock. What is the rock? Jesus and his word. That is the rock. What's amazing to me is a book this size, this little thing right here, this one book right here, he says, I want you to build everything on this. Like, well, that's a small thing to do. Yeah, but it's the strongest thing you'll ever have to build on. I, 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 a few years ago in 2015, we took a mission trip down to Puerto Rico, and we're going actually again this summer back to the same camp that we went and worked at, Camp Caribe down in Puerto Rico. And, and when we got there, we had several jobs that we were supposed to do. And two of the jobs actually involved building walls. One was the wall that went down the, the path that led to the camp, like you drive off the road onto the little path, and there, there was a wall there. But the other one that was starting fresh while we were there was a wall out at the beach right by the water. And they wanted us to build this wall to protect when the storms came, hurricanes, everything that comes down there in Puerto Rico. They wanted us to protect that. And so we built these walls. And, and each group, there's different days, different students would go down and serve, and, and everybody got a chance to try everything. And, and so we were doing that, and as they built these walls, we took a box of little Bibles. Not, not big ones like this, but little Bibles that you can get. And we took a box of those, and every other column, we put a Bible in the foundation. And we just, then we poured the concrete in there. First, we mixed the concrete ourselves, and then we poured it in there. It was awesome. And, and, but every, every one of those columns had a Bible in it. Now, is that ink and paper going to make a difference against rain and wind? No. But it'll never be broken. God's word will never be broken. God's word cannot crumble. It will not be broken. It doesn't matter what storm comes. It doesn't matter how bad it is. It doesn't matter in what area of your life it's happening. God's word will not crumble. What foundation are we building our lives on? What is the foundation that is there? The rock is Jesus and his word. And even in Psalms, it tells us to hide God's word in our heart so that we don't sin against him. Like the key to success in life, marriage, relationships, church, I mean, pick anything, is the foundation of God's word. Like that is our only hope for success. It's our only hope for it not to crumble. It's our only hope for it not to fall apart. But yet we make it our last resort way too often. Well, gosh, things are terrible. What does God say? How can God fix it? Now, he's not our last resort. He's our best option. And if we will build from the beginning on God's word and what it says to our hearts, we will find wisdom and we will find truth. Will we be perfect? No, we will not. We're broken people. But we find hope that the foundation will never crumble. Other things might, but the foundation will not. See, the sand is never stable. It's always shifting, always it's affected by anything that comes its way. Wind, water, rain, walking, it affects it. It's not capable of being stable. It's not capable of holding up. It's temporary enjoyment with disappointing and sometimes devastating results. And, and Jenga's funny to laugh at when they mess it up, but our lives aren't funny when they fall apart. What is our foundation that we, were, we will build on? If you, if you don't choose to do it right, when will you have time to do it over? It, it, the longest route to, a, to, to success is a shortcut. It's not about how quickly you can get it done. It's about how right you can do it the first time or the second time, like Jonah or others.
And I love that we have a God of second chances and third chances. He doesn't give up on us, but he also gives us the blueprints for what a successful foundation looks like. And he's not hiding it. You don't have to get a degree in architecture to understand it. I could never understand anything on those pieces of paper, except that's going to be a house. But I can understand that this is the foundation if I want success in my life that I better build on, that I better choose in that. So as we look forward to that, we have counted the cost and we have chosen our foundation. How do we even know it's going to work? Right? Like these are, these are great ideas. I, I love this. We're going to count the cost and we're going to figure out what it's going to take. And am I willing to make the sacrifice to follow Jesus with everything? Am I willing to take up my cross daily and follow him? Or am I willing to just walk by the cross because it's too hard? But I sure expect him to be there when it gets hard for me. Count the cost. Choose the foundation. The quick, easy foundation. Or am I going to find the rock? Am I going to search and know that my foundation is in God's word? Well, how's it going to work? Even if I do those two things, how do I know it's going to work? Because I'm, I'm kind of dumb. Like, I don't know how to do this stuff. It's all new to me. I'm trying to figure this out. Well, God gives us some hope in this. Actually, our theme verse for the entire week of VBS is Philippians 1.6. And it says this, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Now, that's a lot of good news in there. Being confident of this. Paul is confident about this. Like, that's awesome to know that he's confident. And he says that he who began a good work will carry it on to completion. Like, there's an opportunity that's going to be done. I'm not going to get made fun of. I'm not going to get ridiculed. I'm not going to be going, ah, oh, you laid a foundation, never built on it because you're dumb. And all the, that's not going to happen to me because I'm confident in this. Well, that's, that's awesome. I think that's great. So it gives us point three in this. God will finish what he started. If we will count the cost, if we will choose the correct foundation, he promises that he's going to finish what he started. How can we have that kind of confidence? See, God doesn't waste time. When he does something, he does it right, and he finishes what he starts. And Paul wrote this, and he based his whole life on it. I am confident in this, that he who started a good work will be faithful to complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. Well, how could he be so confident? Like, how could, he, how could he accept this new mission with the confidence of a new ending? Like, how could he do that? How could he, how could he step into the danger zone and get over the mountain and, okay. Because the previous verses answer that question for us. So let's back up in, in Philippians 1 and not just pull verse 6 out of context and say, he who started a good work, be faithful to complete it. I don't have to do anything. No, we have a role in this too. So back up to verse 3 in Philippians 1. And he says this, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all of my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, comma, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. There's one phrase in there that if we miss it, we're missing a key piece to this whole picture of this thing we're trying to build of our lives on a, on a solid foundation and counting the cost and knowing that God will finish it, right? There's an important piece that we need to grab in here, and it's this phrase right here. Because of your partnership in the gospel. See, there's a qualifier that comes in there what makes Paul confident not that he can do it I mean he'll tell you over and over again in his letters that he is not confident and not capable and not able to do it but he's confident in this why because of the partnership of the gospel the gospel the good news of Jesus it's what he did on the cross by by not just dying for our sins and and I get really tired of that phrase to be honest with you because it's not complete he didn't just die for our sins. That was a part of it. He died in our place. That's the bigger piece of it. I'm not separate from my sin. Because of my sin, I deserve death. And Jesus stepped in and said, I will pay that price. I will get on the cross. I will go through the brutal death. And that's why I ask you to pick up yours daily because of what I went through on the cross, because of your partnership in the gospel, because you got it, you understood it, you received what Jesus did for you. And it's so much more than just a head knowledge or a quick prayer. I don't want to go to hell, so I'm going to say this prayer and then all my things are taken care of. It's just not how it works. 
There's so much more. It's a surrendering of yourself. It's a transformation from the inside out. It's giving up all of your rights of what you think is most important. It's not you driving the car of your life anymore, but instead you slide over the passenger seat and you say, Jesus, you can drive and it doesn't matter where you go. I will follow. I will stay with you. I won't grab the wheel. The the brake doesn't work on the passenger side. Anybody who's taught a kid to drive knows that but it's us saying, I'm willing to let you take me wherever you want to go and I won't be in control anymore. You know how hard that is in our culture today when we control every narrative and we snipe people online and we say all these things and we represent stuff online and we're not even being our real self sometimes? But he's telling us here that he is confident in this because of the partnership of the gospel that is there. This salvation that we have, the hope of eternity that we have. Can I tell you this? Salvation is is not a reward for the righteous. It's a gift for the guilty. We are guilty. We stand guilty before God. And Jesus is our righteousness. Jesus is our only hope. And so this idea of salvation is not being good enough or I've earned it. I've checked all the boxes. I've done all the things. I got wet in the baptistry. I went to VBS every year. I did all these things. Those are great, but they're not Jesus. I think of the the story uh, Jesus was telling of the the widow's might. You may may remember the story. He's there at the temple and people are giving their gifts and they're putting all this in. And this one older lady, this widow lady shows up and she puts two copper coins in there. We'll call them pennies. She puts two pennies in there. And they're kind of looking at her like, that's kind of a, kind of a wimpy offering right there. You're not, you're not doing much. And Jesus speaks to them and said, all of you are putting all this money in because you're putting it out of the overflow. This woman gave everything she had. And he noticed. It's so easy to give to Jesus out of the overflow. I don't anything else to do on Sunday. I guess I'll go to church. So if there's anything else that might be more important, I'm going to go ahead and skip that. Well, you know, I only got so many days I can take off. I need to do all of those for me and none for Jesus. I, we have to consider the cost of this. Am I willing to do this? Give my all to him. Now, does that mean everybody needs to quit their job and be pastors and work on church staff? No, that's not what I'm saying because we need missionaries in the schools. We need missionaries at Dell. We need missionaries everywhere that you work. We need that desperately. But are you counting the cost to do that? This woman gave everything, two coins. I like to look at them this way, heart actions. Because so often we're willing to give one or the other. Man, Jesus, I give you my heart so I can go to heaven and I'll feel good in eternity, but I'm gonna do whatever I want the rest of the time. Or I'm gonna be really good and I'm gonna help people and I'm gonna do a lot of things, but I don't need to cross over that religious stuff. I'm just gonna be a really good person. It's both. It's both. Well, if you give your heart, you still get to go to heaven. I don't know. Jesus talks about fruit. I don't get to judge that. He does. But if you truly surrender your life to Jesus Christ, I believe there'll be evidence in your life. They call it fruit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithful, gentle, self-control. All of those things. So don't tell me I gave my heart to Jesus, but I can do whatever I want. You've given up those rights if you've given your heart to Jesus. He's now the contractor that's going to get all the supplies to build your life on the foundation of his word. That's what he wants to do. But there's so many things tempting us to pull us away from that. So we have counted the cost. And I guess we're good with Jesus picking up the cross for us, but are we good picking up the cross for him? What is your life being built on? What is that foundation that's out there? Is it temporary pleasure? Is it your own strength, sports, money, or is it the Word of God? None of those things are evil in and of themselves unless they replace God's Word as most important, unless they replace a relationship with Him. Is it time to make a move because another storm is coming? And maybe that last storm that hit, you realize that foundation is not what it needs to be. Man, things fell into the ocean. Things fell onto the ground. Because I promise you, another storm's coming. That's how the enemy works. And I'm not saying pack up your house and move to a different physical location, but I am saying take inventory of your heart and decide what the foundation it sits on is. And maybe it's time to move foundations. Maybe it's time to check a little deeper of what your foundation sits on. 
but are we counting the cost? Are we looking at that foundation so that we can know that he who started a good work will be faithful to complete it, that God finishes what he starts. But we've got to do this together. It takes all of us to do it. So here's what I'm going to do. Kids, you have a, a Lego brick. Why don't you come on up here? Everybody, come on up here. So come on up. Get right up here in front with me. And I've got this little table here. And the early service kids started it. And you guys have the opportunity to put your Lego piece anywhere on there that you want to put it. You can put it on top of another one. You can put it on the green. You can put it anywhere. You can build it as high as you want to build it. This is totally your call. But once you put yours, kind of back away so others can get, because we have a massive amount of job security walking up here. So keep doing that. Now, parents, while they're doing this, stay here, kids. Stay here. Stay here when you're done. I want you to stay here because I'm going to have your parents do something real quick. But here's what I want you to do, parents, while they're doing this. Y'all just keep putting it on there. Once you put it on, slide out of the way so everybody else can come up there. But stay up here up the front with me on this. So as we build this together, and second service is now building on the first service. Parents, here's what I want you to do. I want you right there. Stay up here with me, guys, because your parents are fixing to do something. I want you to pray for them right now where you sit. Because here's the picture that I want you to walk away with today is this. They're coming up here and they're just putting a piece of Lego on here and it's going to look what it looks like. But I want you to pray for them that they will build on the right foundation. That they will count the cost because here's what they're doing. They're watching you. Are you okay with them building where you're building your life on? Are you okay with the cost that you've counted thinking about their future? Have you done that? So I want you to pray. All right, once you put it on there, don't move anybody else's, guys. It's on there. Don't, don't move anybody else's, all right? Just leave it alone. Everybody gets to put it where they want to put it. Back up. You've done yours. Back up. You've done yours. Slide away. Who hasn't put theirs on? Everybody put it on? Everybody put it on. All right, we're, we're good. So here it is. Stay right here. Because what we're going to do for just a second is we're going to get quiet. And we're going to bow our heads in prayer. This is what we're going to do. And I'm going to give your parents some seconds to pray for you, just at their seat. And then I'm going to pray. And then when we're done with that, the band is going to do a song. And parents, you have a chance to continue that prayer. If you want to come and pray with them here, or they come back to your seat and you pray with them there. I think there's nothing more powerful than for a kid to hear their mom and dad pray for them, to go to God on their behalf. That's how you lay a foundation right here. So everybody bow your head and close your eyes. Parents, you're going to have a moment of silence to pray for them right now.